11 o'clock on your Thursday morning. Welcome in. It is the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. Todd Red, Wes Mitchell, and Chris Clark along with you. Wes and Chris were actually out at spring practice once again earlier on this morning. Had a few observations that they put up on the uh, up on the Gamecock Central uh, boards, and we'll get into all that as the uh, as the show goes along. But but I feel like we can't start off in a better place than talk about Oscar Attaway, who Chris, you got the opportunity to talk to, and we heard that conversation in the um, in the last hour. Dude is not shy. He is he is quite a talker, and uh, you guys had uh, had plenty of good things to go over in the last hour. Yeah, Oscar made it easy, no doubt. Um, knew that he would be a good a great candidate for the Garnet Trust Hour because j- just such an easy conversation. We we could have gone longer. We probably could have gone a couple hours. He told me that he had plenty of time, so uh, we did have to limit it though. And so great conversation. And yeah, we were out there actually. Uh, did get a little bit west. Does it count? What we saw, does that count as a depth chart drill? Because it's a little different. It was Ooh. a third down drill. Did we finally get it? Did it Did it count? There's no such thing as a depth chart drill. You guys know that. <laughs> it's just to pull the names out of a hat drill. We did get a glimpse. No, that though. counts. It counts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's not what we typically call the depth chart drill, but we did see we saw 11 on 11. We got three plays of it. And uh, so we saw you know, some semblance of uh, during that particular period, you know, a first team, right? So we saw some guys that appear to be quote-unquote starters, at least in that particular period on the O-line. Lenore Sellers up first at quarterback, and Oscar Attaway was out there for some reps. Of course, Rocket, you know, is not going through spring, and he's expected to have a significant say, as will others. Uh, But Attaway's a guy that I think he gets glossed over and forgotten a little bit just because of the the presence of Rocket Sanders, he's not you know as big of a name. He came from North Texas, but this is someone that uh, and I think he gave the stats last hour. You know, five point seven yards a carry as a junior, and then last season he was six yards a carry, and someone that the staff really really prioritized very early in the portal. Is he a stat guy? He knew his stats off he the top of his, his head. He did know his stats. He knew his stats. Okay. Humble guy, but he knows what he's done, right? And you know, well, he's, you, not, he's not push. Hey, look hey, at what I did. Look I was, at me. But. I was going to say, you have to be uh, aware of what you're capable of. And if you ever get in a position where you need to, you know, sell yourself a little bit, you got to be able to, you know, pull that out. He did say he wasn't going to be upset if his rating in the video game yeah. was low, though. He's just going to use that as his motivation to go out there and, you know, play even better, I guess. Yeah, he is going to be in the video game. So that's that's fun. That's did good. you ask him what he thinks his rating's going to be? No, nah, he didn't go there. I said, hey, are you going to be Matt? He he said something like, if I'm below, didn't he say 80? I think yeah, it was 80. I, he, said he, he said he didn't really care, but then he said, if I'm below an 80, then he's going to take some issue. With Which it, I so. feel like, you know, I mean, they'll probably have Rocket Sanders somewhere close to 90-ish, maybe even a little bit above that. So. And, okay. you know, typically as you go down the list of the running backs, it – you know, the the second guy, third guy, whatever, usually going to be somewhere around 80 to 75, depending on what team you're on. So he, he might have that motivating factor, depending on how generous EA Sports is to him, I guess. Well, we, we don't know how much research they're going to put into <laughs> all the rating. I mean, think about all the players you actually have lot. to go through. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. I don't know. I'm excited, though. Absolutely. And again, he's getting work with the ones because, again, Rocket Sanders, as you mentioned, not participating in spring, recovering from his injury. And and like you said, this is a guy that we haven't spent as much time talking about because he's not, you know, as featured of a name as a guy like Rocket Sanders. But when you look at his numbers, that six yards of carry and the amount of production he was able to have at North Texas, not only from a backfield standpoint, this is a guy that was able to move around a lot in the offense as well. They lined up in, up in the slot. They put him out wide. He was able to haul in a few receptions over the season. So when I kind of think about, you know, going back to our conversation the other day about, you know, the wide receivers and, yeah, you got some smaller guys that you can do a lot of different things with and line them up in different ways. You also have that variety with a guy like Oscar Attaway as well, including uh, as well if it's a guy like Juju um, McDowell who you moved around and could put out at wide too. So Oscar Attaway brings in uh, kind of a dimensional skill, multi-dimensional skill set to being a running back here. Yeah, I mean, and I've said it before, y'all. I I don't really have much of a concern at all about that position anymore. I, I know a lot of these guys are kind of new to South Carolina, but I, I mean, if you if I was doing the top five or top ten concerns for for this season running back uh, is not on that list for me like I I think it's at a little bit different level obviously than he's gonna be used to um uh, of course but I I think for you know for for those guys I mean Rocket's done it at the SEC level 
Attaway has played teams from multiple conferences and is an older guy, veteran guy, mature. He's going to know what it takes to get his body ready. And then, you know, Jawarn Howell, that's kind of the guy that I, I think is going to maybe not be as well-known as these other two, but eventually is going to push into the forefront as well, whether that's this year or next year. So uh, I think they're in great shape there. Matt Fuller comes in. I mean, he's already, from what I've heard, he's actually – gotten a little bit taller and gained some weight since uh, he was initially being recruited to so throw in dj braswell their forgotten man juju mcdowell who's injured right now will miss the spring but i mean it's kind of one of those what a difference a year makes for south carolina at that spot like i think you know new coach as well and he's actually going to be speaking today is markwell blackwell so uh, i think you're in good shape there and i i think for for Carolina on, on offense, when you kind of look around, guys, you you got a lot of new faces and you got a lot of new kind of younger guys trying to, to gain ground at other spots. And, and, yes, these are new faces at running back, but I don't really put them quite on the same plane as maybe you got a new quarterback, you got this group of receivers that are all jockeying for position. It's just a little bit different at running back, in my opinion. Speaking of running backs, I want to go back to Coach Beamer's presser the other day. And we haven't had a chance to get to this this week, but he was asked specifically about DJ Braswell and the running backs going into this spring. This will be cut number six from yesterday here, Dave. Here's what Coach Beamer had to say. Yeah, uh, he came in as a true freshman and did some things. Y'all heard me talk about it. The game-winning touchdown pass against Kentucky was made possible because of a great blitz pickup that he made where he had to come across the formation and pick up a linebacker or a, a guy coming on the pressure, which is big for a um, – for any running back to do, but especially a true freshman. I think with DJ, it was very much, you know, we tell our, I told the running backs <clears throat> back in January that, look, yeah, we brought in three transfer running backs, talking to Juju and DJ and all those returning guys. And that's not necessarily a knock on you, but that is a opportunity. One, we showed last year with all the injuries we had at running back that you need more than three scholarship running backs. I told you guys before, I was at Virginia Tech and we lost four in one season uh, back in 2014 or 15 and uh, 14. Uh, so we want to increase the depth, but also it's time for DJ or whoever else to, to step up uh, as well. And I think he took that to heart that, okay, you brought in three running backs. I'm going to work and he's got a ways to go, but he worked in the weight room. He's, he can run. There's no question about it. He continues to get stronger. And then being able to do all the things that we want our running backs to do, it's not just running the ball. It's all the other stuff, protections, passing game, all uh, and special teams. And uh, he's continuing to get better. So that's a, another great room with competition. Love what Oscar brings to the table. Love what Rocket brings to the table. Really excited about Jawarn Howe. And then to go along with Juju and DJ and Bradley Dunn and Chase McCracken, Nathan Harris Wayne, and some of the other running backs that we have here in the program. It's a good group. And it's a night and day difference from where this running back room was a season ago going into the spring where, of course, you were short a couple bodies and you had to move to carry on Joiner over there. And we thought that was only going to be a temporary thing that ended up lasting into the season because they weren't able to land anybody else in the transfer portal um, after the spring. So you've got a full room. You've got a bunch of different guys with a, a varying array of talents. And, uh, again, it's one of those areas, while it is a lot of new faces, um, one that we should feel pretty good about going into this fall with. Yeah, like I said, I mean, I th I think you got to feel way better about that, and and seeing Rocket out there, man, not not, you know, able to go practice yet, but uh, I think every time you see him, he's doing a little bit more. Was um, you know, not fully dressed out, but was kind of going through a little bit of the the warm up line there. Doesn't have the big old bulky brace on his shoulder that he had before, so he he's easing back. I, I think with him, the big thing is just to get back into the summer workout program early enough to where he can feel like he is somewhat close to being in football shape, you know, going into the season. And so I, I think, yeah, again, I'm just repeating myself at this point. That That's a position that I feel pretty good about. Yeah, I, I'm curious to see how this thing's going to shake out. You know, this is, Wes, probably one of the most common questions we get before the season. And the staff is typically asked whether it's, whoever the running backs coach happens to be at South Carolina or Shane Beamer. Hey, how, how are you going to split the carries this year? And normally we get some version of, we'll see it's up to, it's up to those guys, but I am kind of fascinated by that because you don't, it's not, as you said, Wes, as much of a question mark this year. And you also don't have, you know, your clear starter and then a Canyon in between everybody else. Right. I, I think, 
like, do I think Rocket's going to be the starter? I do. You know, based on what he's done, what we've seen so far in his career, how he's proven himself. But I also think the guys behind him have legitimate talent. It's not like, ah, you know, who are you going to put in second? Who are you going to put in third? If somebody gets hurt, things look bleak. You know, th there's been some situations where that's happened in the past year at South Carolina. I don't think it's as much the case this year. You have more, you know, proven depth. You feel much better about it. But I, I am curious to see what is that breakout going to be. You know, it could be that Rocket takes it, runs with it. He's the bell cow. He's carrying the ball 20, 25 times a game. Or it could be that the other guys um, are good enough to where it's closer and, and they split it up a little bit more. But if – if there's enough carries to go around, if South Carolina is able to run the ball and stick with the run enough to where we're even having a conversation about splitting carries, that's an upgrade from where things have been. That's a positive because really they haven't been effective enough running the football to sit here and talk about what the rotation should be. Well, they, they threw it so much last year, partially because that's just what they did, yep. partially because of the lack of success as a, a running game in the first place. I think that's a good point, man. If this ends up – part of that answer may be found in what do they become as an offense? Is it kind of what we think it is right now and that you're going to be much more run-based? And, and in that case, you know, it, it may be more of a split, like, you know, 50-50 or 60-30-10 or something like that, but that still may result in quite a few carries – you know, for all those guys. Absolutely. We'll have more observations from uh, another round of practice earlier on today, including what the offensive line may be starting to look like as well as the uh, Gamecock Central uh, takeover hour presented by Firehouse Subs rolls on. Real quick, want to let you know that Elijah and Terry are going to be live out at JT's Kia on Killian Road Saturday from 11 a.m. until 145. JT will also be giving away a car. Terry and uh, Elijah will be giving away baseball tickets to next weekend's series against Texas A&M as well. So come by and see them again. JT's Kia on Killian Road Saturday from 11 a.m. until 1.45. More observations from practice coming up next. Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs on the game. All right, everyone, I'm going to give you all three reasons to choose integrated media for your smart home installation or for any audiovisual needs like a home theater, for instance, at your home or at your business. Number one, they've got years of experience. The owner started the business in 2002, and they're always constantly adapting to new technology, developing technology ever since that day. Number two, you're going to get to see what the team at integrated media is planning to do for you before you start working. Uh, you, you don't have no clue. They keep you in the loop. You can even get a 3D rendering of your home theater or your smart home system before they do it for you. Number three, they pay attention to the details. Technicians treat every home as if it's their own. Michael and Nathan, they've been to my home. They've been to West Mitchell's home. They can come out to yours too. Go check them out. IntegratedMediaInc.com, complete smart home and audiovisual solutions. IntegratedMediaInc.com or 803-948-8327.
Welcome back in Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs, Tyler Head, West Mitchell, and Chris Clark along with you on this Thursday morning. I want to let you know we're going to be hanging out at the Carolina Cup this weekend. I'll be out there uh, in the morning time. Terry Ford will be out there in the afternoon. So come by and see us if you're hanging out at the Carolina Cup out there in Camden. Jumping back in. Oh, Wes, you have a question. I have such fitting breaking news at this point. Okay. Camden's one of Camden's best and brightest. You know what I'm talking about? I do not. Joyce Edwards. Okay. South Carolina women's basketball signee. This worked out so well. Has been named Gatorade National Player of the Year. Fantastic. So the the rich get richer does the South Carolina women's basketball program. And uh, you, you knew she would be in the running for it. And she obviously has been right up there you know, either first overall, second overall, if you look at the various rankings out there. And um, as of about 19 minutes ago, it, it's official. Well, you're going to be talking about another true freshman that's going to come in with the ability to make an impact next year on uh, what is hopefully maybe a defending national championship team once again. Yeah, we're going to find out. So uh, our crew, um, a.k.a. Chris Wellbaum, I believe he's already in Albany. Yes, I believe he is. He is either in the. He was supposed to be in the air from nine until eleven, so he should be there now. Yeah, he's he's going to be there for media day today, and we'll have plenty of coverage leading into that game tomorrow, We're five o'clock. Have him on tomorrow to preview that. Five, yeah, we need to tell correctly. him that. But uh, we yes. need to inform him that he's going to be on the show. <laughs> yeah, I made the executive decision that he is. Uh, fair enough. Chris is always good, so we'll talk to him tomorrow previewing that matchup. Uh, the Gamecocks. I'm taking on Indiana tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock in the Sweet 16. That'll be heard on our sister station, 98.5 WOMG. Um, Want to jump back in the spring football conversation. Another observation you guys had from earlier on this morning. Uh, first look at maybe uh, an offensive line combination. We don't know if this is necessarily the ones or just something that they threw out there for this particular drill. But reading from left to right here, you had Ja'Kai Moore, Kamar Bell, Bershawn Lee, Travon Ball, and Casey Henry out there taking reps as one unit earlier on this morning. Yeah, um, and, and I think that's, again, let, let me give the disclaimer. They've worked some different combinations there, and this was, I think, one to two plays that those guys were out there. But it, it was it's, a little bit different than day one. It's a little bit different than day one. and it's uh, Now, who, who would have been different in that instance? I don't think Bell was in it day one, was he? Yeah. He was. I think. I think. I think that's correct. Um, yeah, Marky Anderson was in there. Marky Anderson was in one. there. But look, and I think this this brings about. We'll get back to that, but like a larger point, there's a little bit of shiny object syndrome with some of the new faces, right? Like the 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 freshman offensive linemen, you kind of know, hey, it, it's not going to be a surprise if those guys don't come in and play immediately. But Josiah Thompson getting, you know, some immediate like wouldn't be a big surprise at all if he ended up factoring in somehow or another in this thing but you kind of forget with those guys coming in because it's another heralded freshman class with some of the transfers you kind of forget about some of the guys that are already on the roster that have played a lot of football Ja'Kai Moore is a good example of that I mean he's going into what this will be year six at South Carolina for him I think um, he's played guard. He's played tackle. He's getting some first team reps at left tackle. And he's a guy that I think could continue to progress. You know, Vershawn Lee's played a lot of football. He's, by all accounts, going to be the starting center, most likely. And then, you know, you got a guy in Case and Henry, very intriguing. You know, the staff has always seemed to like him. Won the starting job before the North Carolina game last year, unfortunately, got rolled up, played about four plays, and, was in, and then was done again. And that was after. He was already recovered from another preseason injury. He's a guy that's big, physical, very aggressive, kind of has some leadership qualities, I think, plays with a mean streak. And so, you know, there's plenty of guys not to – just because this offensive line struggled last year and some of the guys that we're talking about were involved, you can't forget about them. Uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to predict with the exact five with some accuracy – this far out just because there's going to be a domino effect do kai moore right now was the left tackle last week when we were out there for you know very quick segment and then was the left tackle today as well however 
you know, I, I and I think um, don't quote me on this. I think Tree Babalati is just one of the guys that's a little bit banged up right now. So I'm not reading into that too much. I, I think that goes back to kind of what what Beamer says and that hey, don't completely read into it a depth chart at this point because it's not a real depth chart. I think Tree's been a little bit banged up, but still, if you know, and Marky Anderson who was out there day one also is a guy coming off of an injury, so he is still finding himself and uh, getting back, trying to get back to you know 100 percent what he was before I think and so if you look at that position one guy winning a spot could mean well yeah you just beat somebody out but the guy that just got beat out he may just shift over to another spot so Ja'Kai if let's say Tree and Josiah are kind of both holding down left tackle then does Ja'Kai Moore move back to one of those guard spots if Ultimately, Josiah wins out and and is the left tackle. I think that could happen at some point. Then is Tree now fighting at right tackle or even one of the guard spots? He, I mean, he's a wide-bodied kid. He, we, We've always known he could play guard or tackle. And so I, I do think we, we just don't know how this is going to kind of shape out yet, but you do have more options there. And, you know, if – if a guy who Boogie Huntley spoke very highly of yesterday and Torricelli Simpkins the third, if he pushes really, really hard at center, mm-hmm. we've seen Vershawn Lee play multiple other spots, yep. guard or tackle. Yep. So do you sit there and say, well, wow, both these guys should be on the field. You're not going to move Simpkins because he's more – he can play guard, but he's he's more of a center, I think. So you say, all right, Torricelli, you're now the center. Vershawn, you're starting elsewhere. So I think because of all the different aspects, like the domino effect at play here, you you could write five guys in a row, but I think it'd be pretty difficult, what, five months out to, to yeah. actually predict it. Well, and I think the word that you use there is kind of a theme at a few positions, um, which should excite some Gamecock fans. Now, on the other side, there's some positions – that maybe have more questions than they did last year. Then you got some positions that you feel better about. The word options, you know, think about, we just finished a conversation first segment about running back. You've got more options because of your personnel there. Last spring you go in saying, all right, here's a transfer from Division Two. ended up being a good player, and here is on Joyner who's never played running back since Pee Wee, and that's kind of what you've got. That's what you're rolling with. This year a lot different because of your personnel. Um same thing with the offensive line. Remember the offensive line going into the UNC game last year was a was a pretty big concern. Ended up being well validated because we saw what nine sacks in that game. You had some questions about who who are going to be the tackles. Is there enough experience there? What's the talent like? You've got more options now. Some of them are younger. Some of them are transfers. And I think this is a position on the offensive line where the competition is going to continue. We're, Whatever the starting five, quote-unquote, is exiting spring, you still got a whole summer in preseason. And because of the, I think, quality and experience and talent of some of these players, you know, it, it could shift over time. It could even shift, you know, in the middle of the season. But it's nice to have those options. Makes I, you feel better about the picture. I think, based on what we saw last season with all the injuries – and with all the guys you had to rotate in on the offensive line, I think it's just as important to figure out who that second group of guys is going to be should you run into those problems again and see who's going to slide in, who's going to move around, and what your other theoretical options outside of just the starting five are going to be because knock on wood, hopefully it doesn't happen, you could run into the same issues again. Yeah, and at the very least, you want to find, so all right, here's your five. Now, who's my six? Who's my seven? Who's my eight? And perfect world you'd want to have five and five you know your full 10 but at the very least you want to go into it you know last year uh, I think we were talking about going into game week and we were sitting there trying to gather all right who who are the two starting offensive tackles so not only you you're not you're not even at the point that you're finding six seven and eight you're still trying to find your top five and so and, and it really wasn't that that can be two things right that can be well, wow, these guys are just performing so well that you don't quite have a starter yet. Or it can be that you have big questions, and, and that ended up being the case last year. So who who's your sixth? That guy could be a tackle, a guard, or a center, as long as you have a corresponding move to get that guy on the field. Ideally, 
six, seven, eight. One of those guys is a tackle, one's a guard, and one's a center. Or, you know, maybe one of them is just a, a versatile guy. But I, I think the versatility of this group as a whole, Ja'Kai, tackle guard, Rashawn, center guard, tackle, tree, tackle, potentially guard as well, those things let you be able to kind of just say, all right, this is my sixth, this is my seventh, this is my eighth guy, and then have an a avenue to get them on the field. Absolutely. We will shift the uh, focus over to the defense on the other side, as we did hear from a lot of defensive players yesterday talking to the media. Real quick, though, as we head into this break, have more tickets to give away for next weekend's uh, baseball series against Texas A&M. A couple more pairs for Friday night's game out at Founders Park. Got a pair for callers number three and callers number four right now. 803-404-6100, a pair of tickets to see the Gamecocks take on the Aggies next weekend out at Founders Park. We'll talk defense and hear from some of the players coming up next. Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs on the game. All right, guys, everybody that owns a home knows that the roof is one of the most important aspects of your home, and we want to make sure that your roof is getting taken care of as it should. Uh, call our friends at Classic Roofing today, 803-590-7870, or head on over to ClassicRoofingSC.com, where you can get more information on their services, or you can set up a free estimate where they're going to come out and take a look at your roof. Uh, again, if you go online, classicroofingsc.com, or if you want to email them information at classicroofingsc.com, you can set up that estimate. A roof is going to re require more work as years pass by, so keeping it strong enough to safeguard you and your family it's just a phone call away. Classic Roofing will gladly provide all the residential roofing solutions you will ever need, from new installations to replacements and repairs. They specialize in a variety of services. Also, get that free estimate now.
Welcome back in. Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. Tyler Head, West Mitchell, Chris Clark along with you on this Thursday morning. Uh, remind you once again, next Friday, April the 5th, going to have our annual 107.5 Game Spring Golf Tournament out at the Charwood Golf Club in West Columbia. If you want to take part, it's $400 for a foursome, $200 for a pair. Going to have a 10 a.m. shotgun start. Going to be giving away USC baseball tickets, Carowind tickets, concert tickets, craft beer passports, and much, much more. If you want to take part, give Charlotte a call, 803-755-2000. Register, again, 803-755-2000 to take part in the 107.5 The Game Annual Spring Golf Tournament. Yesterday, uh, we heard from defensive players for the first time talking to the media this spring, uh, one of them being Kyle Kennard, the transfer edge coming in from Georgia Tech. And I want to play this clip here. Uh, he was asked, you know, if there, uh, what he thought about some of the younger guys that he saw on the defense uh, through his first couple of days of practice. I mean, it's been going great as far as bringing them guys up and uh, stepping in. And me and another older guy that I'm sure I know who it is, he, he coming in, we're talking to him and uh, – as far as the young guys, they're getting better every day. Uh, just like uh, Debo said with his young guys in this room, same with me, uh, Dylan Story. He's an av athletic freak. Uh, I haven't seen anything like it from a freshman, a guy that young. And then um, just the guys who are becoming, stepping into older roles, uh, BT, Brian Thomas, and uh, a couple other guys there. That's been seamless, flawless in our room. So. And here's another guy singing the praises of Dylan Stewart, as many guys have so far, as well as the coaches. And uh, that's obviously very encouraging because, again, we have a guy that comes in as such a highly touted prospect. You want him to come in and, and be able to make an impact right away. And, and, again, the edge room is one that there's a reason they went out and addressed it so much in the transfer portal and wanted to bring in a guy like Dylan Stewart because they didn't have a lot of production out of there this past season. So there's another ring endorsement. But he also brings up Brian Thomas, somebody that's been around the game for a, a while now. And, um, you know, had his varying degrees of success and um you know we'll see what kind of jump he could potentially make in, in another year here at south carolina let's go back to that word again of options you know man i you would you would really have to stretch to not say that they have better options this year at this position as well now they do lose jordan strong who was a seventh year guy last year had a lot of experience and made a good many plays for them he was a good player so his loss you know, I think has some significance to it. You also, Tyreek Johnson was a very steady player for you. He was not a superstar by any means, but he was a guy that had plenty of experience, was very technically sound. He could give you some quality snaps each game and make some plays for you. But then, then you look and, you know, Drew Tuizama started last year as an edge. Event, he moved to tackle during the season, which is where he's at now. Donovan Westmoreland was an undersized guy. He's, he's since transferred. Terrell Dawkins had some injuries here at Carolina. He, he recently transferred. And so then you look, out of that group I just mentioned, the guys coming back are, are BT, Brian Thomas Jr., Desmond Yumiazulu, who was a true freshman last year, and JT Gear, who was a transfer, who's still young, and also battled a couple little injuries last year. So I think Des you, JT Gear. Brian Thomas Jr., then you throw in Elijah Davis because he moved to edge. You know, those guys I think are all going to be a year older, a year more comfortable, I think a year better. Brian Thomas put, Jr. put on some weight in the offseason. Des Yu was a former four-star guy. But then, Tyler, to your point, you look at the guys that they've added, you know, to this roster. You bring in a, a super freshman, a five-star plus, a consensus five-star in Dylan Stewart. And a guy who who has looked the part, everybody's sung his praises. That doesn't mean he's going to be Jadavion Clowney in year one, but he, I think, is going to make an impact. And then Kennard, a guy that, you know, he's done some good things in college. So he had four sacks in a game at one point at the Power Five level. So um, Gilbert Edmond being back, he's a guy that started football games in the SEC, and he's played in the SEC and the ACC. So more options here, and I think more depth overall. Yeah, I think... You look at that spot, man. It'll be fascinating to see how it actually plays out. But I think we already are starting to get a little bit of an indicator of, of what that at least too deep is going to look like there. Although I, I was just looking back at my, my camera from practice today, and um, I think Des Yu was out there getting some, some run with the ones. So I think that's noteworthy as well. 
Desu is interesting because, you know, we talk about these guys coming in from the transfer portal, talk about Dylan Stewart, and yes, you can kind of fall into that shiny object syndrome because it's new additions to the team. But again, Desu came in as a four-star season ago, and yes, he did get his opportunities on the field and maybe didn't produce at the level some people thought he was going to, but this spring is going to be very important for a guy like that and what his development can be and what kind of steps he can take forward in year number two where he could maybe be one of those future guys coming off the edge. Uh, again, he's only going into his true sophomore year now so there's no telling what kind of jump he can make going into year number two yeah I think we always got to be a little bit more patient with these guys when, when they come in not not everybody's going to come right in and and light the world on fire but he you know he he played as kind of a I don't know maybe fourth edge guy last year was was in on some pass rush situations like he was one of those guys he got his feet wet which is very valuable and and played I, I remember doing the little freshman tracker thing that I, I do played a, like a handful of snaps each game which I, I think certainly kind of keeps you dialed in as a true freshman sometimes when you red shirt it, it's hard to stay dialed in because you're just not you're not really part of the team like you are on practice days but you're not on game days and so I, I think that was incredibly valuable for him last year and it, it's gonna it's gonna be one of those the cream rises to the top situations I, I think in, in the edge room now Kyle Kennard comes in you, you sort of the things you hear about him I personally tend to think it's going to be difficult for anybody to unseat him I, I kind of think he's a starter but you start naming names and at, at what point you know at what point does Dylan Stewart make that start making that push where it's just like it doesn't matter that he's a freshman is that at some point in spring is that at some point preseason is that mid-year is that next year you know but you, you at some point though that talent you imagine is going to kind of kind of push to the top and I, I think the question too is all right are these going to be situational guys like all right Dylan Stewart is basically at this point a pass rush specialist or is it going to be that he is firmly in that rotation at, at that edge spot yeah, and, what, and what's that rotation look like? You know, because ideally you would want to be able to rotate a little bit more. Defensive line, you were talking about running back rotation earlier. I think that's a position you can you can do a little bit more of a bell cow approach if you got a guy who's got the hot hand and, and deserves to take the line share of the carries. But on the defensive line, if if you have legitimate depth to where there's not your starter and your your second guy, your third guy, if there's not as much drop off there, you'd love to be able to rotate those guys in. So on third downs, they can go rush the passer. Those big guys, they get a lot of coaches say this, point this out. You know, when they get tired, it's hard, you know, late in games. And what do you hear in a lot of games, not only at South Carolina, but other places? If it gets late in the game, and let's use South Carolina as an example, obviously. We've heard many times, hey, we played too many snaps defensively. And we got worn down, you know, so you got to fix both those things. Obviously, you don't want to be playing too many snaps in the first place. But if you have to, if that's the way that the game has gone, you don't want your D-lineman tired later in the game. So um, you want to have that legitimate depth. I think they have more options this year. I, too, Wes, am intrigued. I, I agree with you, Kennard. You know, he's flown, I think, a little bit under the radar as an acquisition this offseason because he's he started 20 games in his career. He started, I think, or he's played in, I think, 40, 45 games during his career. So he has a lot of experience. He's got size. He's got pass rush juice. I think he probably, if you had to call it, begins the season as a starter, and then let's see where everybody else lands. And another part, too, is you start to talk about these guys are, are you know, defensive ends or edge guys, however you want to call it, is a starter when they're in that 4-2-5 is probably going to be a little bit different in the three three five, and because of the number of guys you have it's maybe not necessarily like hey man you're just the best player so you're just going to start regardless of which package we're in whereas now it could be more like wait you do the things that you need to do in the three three five, which is typically a little bit bigger guy needs to hold up against the run he's kind of a squished in like a couple of gaps over from where you are in the four two five. It's just a little bit different in an ideal world. So maybe it can be a little bit more of an ideal situation than it was at times last year. Do we know what day y'all get to observe practice again next week? Not sure yet. No. Okay. 
to be determined on that. But uh, just be, putting us on the spot again. Tyler. Well, hey, you know, you never know. It just uh, it's always interesting to see the, the difference between one practice and the next, and what you guys are able to observe. So we'll get to that bridge when we get there. We'll come back and uh, wrap up today's edition of the Gamecocks Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs. Big baseball series getting rolling tonight for the Gamecocks on the road in Tuscaloosa. So we'll dive into that a little bit coming up. Gamecocks Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs here on the game.
Welcome back in Gaming Couch Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs. Tyler Head, Wes Musher, and Chris Clark along with you for a few more minutes on this Thursday. A reminder once again about the uh, Palmetto Citizens Federal Credit Union Grand Slam giveaway going on all baseball season long. When a Gamecock hitter hits Grand Slam this year, you could win all the money in the pot. That is currently up to $650. Um, so getting higher and higher with the games as they go along. $25 out of the pot each and every time. Again, go on to 1075game.com register for your chance to win Palmetto Citizens Federal Credit Union Grand Slam giveaway. Another opportunity coming up tonight to maybe hit a Grand Slam as Gamecock baseball hits the road to take on Alabama in Tuscaloosa for a Thursday through Saturday series as uh, Gamecocks went through it for the second time in SEC play this year. Um, obviously, was on the road at uh, Ole Miss to open up. SEC play dropped two of the first three games of, the, of uh, that series but have been on a six-game winning streak since then. And you go in taking on an Alabama team as are many teams in this conference, capable of scoring a lot of runs. So South Carolina's offense is going to be have to on, have, going to have to be on its game this weekend if they want to come away with the series victory. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, look, th this is a team that has really come. I mean, the bats have warmed up, right? I mean, they have really, really warmed up. We saw it against Vanderbilt, which was, man, you can't even say that was, I mean, it was a great sign, but it wasn't just a sign. Like you you did what it took you got you got finally that combination that combination that's been a little elusive at times this year of the great pitching Tyler Pitzer comes in he's a revelation now he's going to be a starter you know earns a weekend start deservedly so but you had the combination of great pitching and then the bats heated up right and and that's what you needed because after a few games this year it was kind of one or the other was missing. A lot of times it was the hitting, right? A lot of times it was, you know, you got a bunch of guys on base. You just didn't quite come through, didn't get the clutch hit that you needed. And and everybody was kind of waiting on, okay, when is the top of that lineup? You know, Ethan Petri, had, he had already been there. Messina had shown his power in spots that we knew he had, but it kind of has come together lately. And even though, look, we talked about the PC game, kind of an outlier probably from a pitching standpoint, probably from a hitting standpoint too because you're not going to score 19 runs in most games. But the, the bats, they continued. And now you're getting to the weekend on a hot streak from a hitting standpoint. And then also you feel like you might have kind of unlocked something on the pitching front as well. Yeah, I think this this pitching staff, we, we knew as the year started that – there was maybe more depth here than than we maybe initially thought on paper, but I, I still think there were some questions about is, is this an elite staff in terms of matching up with the teams you're playing in SEC play, right? Like, I mean, you're going to face a top 25 team just about every weekend, so you can be really good. You can have some really good pitchers and still come up just short against some of these teams, but I, I think what we're seeing – I mean, the, the way they pitched last week against Vandy was a just very, very good sign for, for this group. And, you know, they, I don't think they necessarily, at this point, as far as their top three guys, they don't necessarily have those draft pick types. You know, this time last year you came in, Will Sanders was high on all these draft boards, but st really did not pitch to the standard that, he set or the expectations that you would have set for him that you know that's just a reality of it but uh, you know it was a big tall kid that you were expecting he's pitched since he was a freshman you were expecting to get a, a big year from him and it just never happened and so even behind him you had some other guys in the rotation that you know I, I think could potentially um you know play at the major league level this group doesn't quite have the guys yet that are you know throwing 98 but they've just pitched and you know they, they've they've thrown strikes they get a lot of movement on their pitches and you know if Pitzer can give you anything close to what we saw from him last week then you, you always if you're going to have a special year and if it's a spot where you have questions if you're going to have a good year you're always going to need a guy or two that you weren't necessarily counting on on paper to step up and be ready before you expected them to. 
that could be the case here for South Carolina. And Pitts has earned that uh, third starting role for this weekend as well. Now, there was a little bit of a question on if they'd kind of shuffle things around because you are on a shorter week starting your series on Thursday. Also, given the fact that you started this past series against Vanderbilt on Saturday, so Eli Jones going off of five days rest pitching tonight. You're going to have Eskew on the mound tomorrow, and then Pitts are getting the start on Saturday against Alabama to wrap up the series. So, um, again, hopefully another uh, good performance out of Pitts, and, and he might have that spot locked down, but at least has it for this weekend as opposed to uh, kind of having the TBD like they've done the past couple of weeks. Hey, it could be a a precursor for him. Uh, get ready for – that's how they do it at the, the big level. Yeah, so. ab- absolutely. So, again, that game coming up tonight, game number one, 8 o'clock right here on the game pregame coverage starting at 745.